Who said no? How many of you want it to get colder? Raise your hand. <laughs> Only if it, you don't want no snow. Just say no to snow. <laughs> no. <laughs> Those of us who have lived in it, no snow, no snow. And uh, you could always do like me once, it, once you know, all this stuff shifts and we go in the ice age, start shoveling snow. That's what they're saying anyway. They don't know what they're talking about, but that's what they're saying. And uh, so, how many of you want it to be warmer? That's what I thought. Okay. About 10 degrees, stay there. Lock us in, Lord. Lock us in. <laughs> about 72, 76 degrees. Well, y'all, let's get into the word. Um, I want to go back and pick up where we left off, uh, not last Wednesday, because it was Thanksgiving, sir, or last yeah, it was Tuesday, but it was a Thanksgiving service. But um, let's go back, and we're talking about unlimited power. It's all spiritual. Everybody say it with me. It's all spiritual. How many of you are figuring out it's all spiritual? Now, you know, I shared this story with some people whenever I first came in, but, you know, Pam and I, we went to the mountains, and, of course, Thanksgiving, um, you know, we got to eat, but then everything shuts down, and, the, and Maggie Valley is kind of a, even though it's a tourist area, it's a small town. And so there really wasn't a lot to do other than relax, which I enjoyed. Pam doesn't like relaxing very much. She wants to go all the time. And, uh, you know, but um, we got a chance to just relax a little bit. And then uh, we were going to see some shops that were specially, that were artists and craftsmen that did their own thing. So we took a, I don't know, it was about a 15-mile track out of Gatlinburg where you go up, hit a dead end, take a right, hit a dead end, and, and then you end up where the banjos play and find your way back to civilization is basically the way it was. And um, we really wasn't that great, you know, as far as some of the things that we were interested in. But we got an opportunity. Um, we walked in this one place where an artist had just set up. We got to talking to him and, and learn a little bit about him. And um, he asked me what I did. He said, what do you do for a living? And I told him I was a pastor. And he said, look, let me show you something. He said, see this man right over here? And the guy was standing in the place. He said... He talked me into going to church, I think it was three months ago, and he said, I gave my heart to Jesus, and everything changed. So how many of you know, it's all spiritual. You know, well, he just opened up. He'd only had a couple of customers. We were the next couple of customers that came in, and uh, we talked to him for a while, and, I, and we went to leave, and when we started to walk out, the Holy Spirit quickened to me just to pray with him. So we gathered, and, and I prayed for his business, got a chance to pray for the favor of God on his life, you know, I don't know what he gets taught in church. You don't, you don't understand sometimes when you come into contact with people. But um, when we got out and we got in the car, my wife looked at me and she said, who knows, this whole trip may have been just about that connection. Everybody say connection. Because God is that way. You know, he will go out of the way to bless one person. And a lot of times we don't realize this. We're, we could be that one person. So every time you bless somebody, you get an opportunity to sow seed for a blessing to come your way. And that, that way, when the storms of life come, you got something that you can count on. But we're talking about unlimited power and how everything is spiritual. In Acts 1 and verse 8, and we've read this, and I just want to go through it quickly. It says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, what he's saying here is this power that he was going to invest into us. Everybody say power. This is important for us to understand, guys, because God never meant for the church to turn on the... He didn't never mean, mean to turn us on with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the afterburners to get us off the dirt and then shut it off so we could cruise. All right, he, we got to keep the fire lit. We got to keep this thing going. And of course, you know, I'm on a big thing right now in my own life and trying to push you in your life to get on fire. Everybody say fire. So it's amazing to me how a lot of people today and a lot of dom denominations today will turn around and teach where well, the Holy Spirit's not for today when it was just prophesied here and spoken of that it wouldn't only be in your hometown, outside your hometown, but to the end of the earth. And the earth has not ended. So that's, that's proof. That's one part of the proof, okay? So there's a power that is available in your life and for your life that can totally change everything about your life. Give me a big amen there, guys. And, and it changed, the baptism of the Holy Spirit changed my life. Well, we set it up this way. We talked about prayer. Everybody say prayer. And that's the setup. It, 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 that's how it, it makes heaven happen in your life. 
Uh, last time we were together, we talked about openness. Everybody say openness. And that's where we receive so we can release. I mean, literally, if you're open to receive, you got something to, I mean, to relieve to people. You can give away what you possess. It's hard to go find it when you're in need. And that's why, that's why the power of the Holy Spirit is so important in your life because he takes the gifts of heaven, deposits them into your spirit, gives you access, grants you access to everything you need. So therefore, you as a Christian should be able to accomplish anything that God sets in front of you. Because you don't have to manifest it. All you got to do is tap into it. And that's what we were talking about, openness. Everybody say hallelujah, because this it's going to get better than this. Well, then we went, we're going to go tonight into worship, which is, I call this vertical alignment. It changes things about your life when you really and truly learn how to worship and, and find out that worship's not a pattern that you just perform. Worship is, is, is something that you do. I mean, it, it actually is some, it's an attitude. I'd like to say it that way because I can worship even though I'm talking to people. I can get in an atmosphere of worship and change everything about my life. I don't have to get angry about every little thing that happens. Come on, y'all. But, I can, I can, but it doesn't mean I have to be happy about everything either. There, there is a happy place that we can get to, to where we can live a life of peace. And, and when, when God does the amazing, it doesn't shock us because we're used to it. You follow me? And we have something that we can give out. So we're going to get into that one tonight. And then we're going to go into endorsed, which is a seal. We're going to talk more about the Holy Spirit in our lives. And then release, which is part of being an effective minister or effective child of God, doing what God's called you to do. So now let's go into worship a little bit because I want you to see this. I'm going to, I'm going to go a little bit different. John 4, verses 23 and 24 and I'm starting off with this because, you know, uh, Jesus was talking here and he, he said there's going to come a point in time when the true worshipers of God are going to learn how to worship different. In other words, it's not going to be something that you're going to do that's a ritual. It's not going to be something that you do just to do or out of a pattern that we've been taught. You know, we, um, let me see. Oh, I want to be careful here. How many of you know there's times that in my life to where I, I felt led to take off my shoes because the place where we were at at that point in time was holy ground. Come on, y'all. Anybody ever felt like that? But how many of you know it wasn't because the place was anointed? It's because the presence of God was there and anointed the place. But every time I go into God's presence, I don't have to take my shoes off. You know, I, I remember hearing a church years ago that had a rug. You know, the person kept telling, I think it was Kenneth Hagin, told him, said, if you get people on that rug, they'll get filled with the Holy Spirit because that rug's anointed to fill them. Well, there ain't no rug anointed to fill nobody. God is the one who anoints and does it. So, you know, when we tap into the true resources of heaven, we got to flow. Now, listen to what he says here in John 4 and verse 23 and 24. He said, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers, everybody say true worshipers, will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So to access things, there's a proper way to do it. And it's not a pattern way, it's having relationship. This is what I want to tell you about worship tonight. I don't have a problem worshiping God, you know, when people are around, because I never do it regardless of what people think. I always do it because he's worthy of it. All right, so that changes everything. So that means, and I, I've seen people go through patterns, and I've seen people start off, and I shared this with you. We had one lady in Florence, she danced in the Spirit, and she, when the Holy Spirit would get on her, I mean, she would just start dancing, and she was just as smooth as could be. I mean, she would get up, she would twirl, she would spin, and it was, I, I guess, just, um, I don't know whether you call it prophetic dancing or whatever it was, but, I mean, she... You could tell it was anointed, and when it happened, everybody would just relax in the presence of the Lord, and there was anointing released from her whenever that took place. And we actually had people get healed in the service just from her being obedience and dance. Which one of y'all want to be that person here? No, <laughs> I didn't think so. But, but listen, what if, what if you develop your worship in such a way 
to where that's how, how you worship all the time. And when you get around people, it just flows from you naturally, spiritually, but naturally. It's not something you practice. It's not something you patterned out. You, you hadn't rehearsed the steps. But then, then God just releases that anointing through you. We, we had another lady in the church that thought she could dance that same way but wasn't anointed to do it. So when the one lady would start dancing and, anointing was, and the anointing was being released, she would get up and try to dance too, and she'd stumble and trip and twirl and fall and get back up, you know. And, but you know what? Never disturbed what was being done in truth and in spirit. I had a guest speaker in one time. Um, this was in West Virginia. And he, he was anointed, had a healing ministry like you wouldn't believe, but got mad because people... We're getting up during the service and going to the bathroom. And he, he said something. He let it get so much under his skin till he said something out loud. He said, what is it with you guys getting up and going to the bathroom? Can't you wait until after the service? And it, there was an anointing in the house and a teaching anointing in the house. And as soon as he did that, the anointing lifted. Everybody say it lifted. All right. And then after church, you know, we went to the Chinese buffet, which was the only buffet we had. In Kingwood, we didn't have a whole lot. I had a Pizza Hut, and I'd already had that. And so, you know, we, we went to the buffet, and he walked up to me, and he said, "You know, the people really disturbed the anointing today in the church." Well, you know me. I'm just cuthful. I'm direct sometimes, and you know, and my wife, she looked at me. She wasn't close enough to grab my leg. Amen. She was on the other end of the buffet or at the table. And I looked at him and I said, the only reason why the anointing lifted today is because you got offended. And if anybody else, if anybody is to blame for there being no miracles today, it's you. How many of you know he shut up? But it was the truth. Now, I mean, and I was kind of aggravated with him. Oh, well, anyway. But when we get in spirit and in truth, it changes everything. Listen, the Father is seeking such who will do that. In other words, something has changed now, guys. It's not just a pattern of worship that we go through. It, it, it's something we develop in our lives. Do you understand? I mean, there's, there's times, you know, that you just, you're, you're not going to feel like it. Anybody ever had that? And you try to put on music, and music tries to move you into that area. And I'm going to share some of those things with me. There's been times when I can just lay down and put on a particular song, and it changes the atmosphere. Let me say it this way. It changes the atmosphere in my head, and it clears up some of the fog, and it makes it so I can enter in. Okay, so we had those times. So let me read this in the Passion Translation. It says, <clears throat> From here on, worshiping the Father will not be a matter of right place, but with the right heart. Everybody say the right heart. Hey, can I tell you something? Church is not the only place you should worship. Church is not the only place you should worship. And, I, and I've always done this, and, and sometimes people don't like it. I, I tell the praise and worship team, whenever I was leading the praise and worship team here, they know this, and in the church in Florence, I mean, I told them, you, if you want to worship God, you need to do it at home. Because when we get on that platform, we have a duty doesn't mean you can't worship, but you can't worship on that platform leading like you can worship at home because you're setting a standard. People are watching you. Your job at that point in time is to lead them into worship. So you need to pay attention. You can't close your eyes and just get lost and fall on the floor and roll around. You can do that at home. Come on, y'all. You know what I'm saying? But now if the Holy Spirit comes in and glory falls, we all going to be on the floor. Roll with us, baby. You know, and I don't have a problem with that, but there, there's, there's certain things that we got to understand. So worshiping the Father will not be a matter of right place, but it'll be a matter, I'm going to say it this way, a matter of, of having the right heart. For God is a spirit, and he longs to have sincere worshipers who worship and adore him in the realm of the spirit and in truth. Do you see that, guys? So we can, we can switch that over. A lot of people today are worshiping from here instead of here. And the reason why we love entertainment, are y'all going to hang with me through this? We love to be entertained. So if we go into church and we can get entertained, it settles something in our mind 
but we never may access God with our spirit. And this, this is why it's so important. You can, have, you can have things set in place to where you got song after song after song, but sometimes you just need to stop and worship from here and just let it flow out of your innermost part of who you are. You know, and write a new song to the Lord. Do it at home first. Amen. But develop yourself to where you can sing a song to the Lord. You know, and there'll be times in in my car, y'all, people, I lose myself while I'm driving, so therefore you can worship without your eyes being closed. Please, if you're driving, worship. It's not God's job to drive your car. All right, but there's been times where I've got lost in worship in the car because of something that came on. And I mean, I'm lifting my hands up. I'm at a red light, and I'm worshiping God, and people on both sides of you looking at you like, he gone nuts. That's okay. I'd rather be worshiping God. So you can access this. So you can do something different. Let me tell you what worship means in this verse of Scripture. Are you ready? It means to depress. Why'd y'all get quiet? To worship, let me read it all. To depress, that is, to put yourself down because of God's royalty. To bow yourself. To crouch or fall down flat. To be humble. To hear just stoop, to make stoop in worship. So worship is saying, you know what, God, this time is not about me, it's about you. So therefore, I can stop everything I'm doing at this point in time. And and let me say it like this, guys. You can shut it down in here and worship from here and truly access everything that God has. And other people may not even know it. Now, that doesn't mean that your emotions are not going to be affected by it. You know, there, there was, you know, times where I just, I need something different in my life. Can I, can I tell you two things I believe for? Can I, can I just do it, be, it? do you good to do this, okay? I believe for that worship experience that is going to change my life. Come on, y'all, I believe for that. I, I want to I leave, I want to leave, and I, I want to have such an aroma of worship. We'll see this after a while. Such an aroma of worship whenever I get around people. I want them to smell the worship. You know, I, I, I don't want, I, I, I don't want to be old stale Christian. Come on, y'all, I want, I want to be alive. Do you want, I'm a lively stone. That means whatever touches me is going to sizzle. Do you understand? I, I mean, I want to be hot for God. I want to be cooking. Do you understand? So there's times, in my, at times that I'll just go in the room. I'll tell Pam, I, I, I just, I, you, go ahead, excuse me, baby. You can finish the show. I go in the room, and I close the door, and I turn on some worship music, and I lay down on the bed, and I'll just worship, and I'll roll all over the bed. I do. I mean, I, I just worship God, and... You know, and, and, and I'll get louder and louder, you know, and finally she can't help but join in because that's the way God is. He's, he's so good that once you access him, he's just going to give more because he don't draw back until you tell him to. Do you understand? And then another thing that I do, and I know some people understand this and some people don't, I, 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 I believe to be, I hate to say it this way, not refilled with the, with the Holy Spirit, but I believe for God to change my whole prayer language different times of the year. Just give me a different language, Lord. It's not that, not that I'm tired of, of, of what's being done already, but I just need that fresh. I need that new. Do you understand? I had a friend of mine, he'd pray in five different, ten different languages when he prayed in the Spirit. I used to laugh at him. He'd kick over in Chinese. and kick, I mean, he would do all kinds of things, you know. And, and uh, I used to laugh at him. And then one time I was laughing at him, and uh, the Lord shifted me, and I started praying different. So I don't laugh at people anymore. But the worship means that you depress yourself because you're saying to God, God, right now, I am not the important thing you are. Listen, y'all, worship works this way. God, right now, what's all the stuff in my life, even though it's been at the forefront of my life, it's not the important thing. Are you getting this, y'all? I want to make... You are. Now, what happens? You create a flow to settle all that stuff that's taking place in your life. And, and this is what worship does. I know I'm teaching a little bit more. Let's go to Psalm 29 in verse 2. We're going to start. Yeah, we'll just read verse 2. 
Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. What does it mean? Did somebody tell me what you think it means to give unto the Lord the glory due his name? How do you give God glory due his name? Have you thought about this? How much glory does he deserve? I mean, have you thought about how do you give God all the glory that he deserves? How do you do that? I mean, because, you know, a lot of us, you know, we, if we're not careful, we get busy with our own lives and we don't even think about God through his day. I'd venture to say some of you, how many of you worked a full day today like I did? How many of you took time to think about God? At least a couple of times. <laughs> but how many of you are so busy you didn't get a chance to? I mean, that's the thing about it. I mean, I, I've been on the ladder and got thinking about God before and have to come down and, and, and get out the way for a little bit. You know, because we can worship God, and worship changes the atmosphere. It changes everything about us. Well, when we learn to give God the glory due His name, listen to this, and worship the Lord in the beauty of His holiness, I mean, that means that it's going to shift things. How can you glorify God without it shifting your whole personality and everything that you are? Have you thought about how, how do you get into God's presence and stay the same? Am I, am I saying anything? I mean, how do you do that? How can... How can you come into a worship service and leave as dead as when you came in? I mean, how can you come into a worship service and worship God and leave more depressed than when you walked in the door? Come on, y'all. Oh, man. How, how can you come in and worship God? How can you have that worship time and go out sicker than when you walked into His presence? I mean, think about this, guys. It changes everything about us. God is a consuming fire. He is an all-consuming fire. And if we're not going upwards toward everything that we're worshiping for, we're doing it from our heads and not from our spirit. We're going for the feeling rather than a true attempt at worship. Well, glory to God. You know, and I, and I do this, guys. I'm, I'm, you know, I had a friend of mine at work. You know, I mentioned him before Marion Post, and he come in, he had the flu. And uh, he come to work sick. Come on, I mean sick. And, you know, and the boss man told him, said, look, you just need to go home because you're going to make everybody sick. Well, isn't that something? Well, you know, that's, that's, what, that's what's sad. That's what, you know, Pam, if they have people come in where she works that sick, they'll make them put a mask on or send them home. Because they don't want to get everybody sick. So he, what he did was the boss was telling him he needed to go home. He come and found me. Because I was his prayer buddy. I'm his worship buddy. You understand? And he took, me in, he took me and locked me in the office with him. Wasn't that just encouraging? And this is what he said. He said, now, Rick, he said, I want you to do me a favor. I said, what is that? He said, I want you to pray with me until this flu leaves. There wasn't nobody else coming in that office. So we prayed, man. And I'm telling you right now, you know, you, you ever pray and start hitting a happy note? Have you ever done that? You know, you start out praying, you say, oh, Lord Jesus, please, God, have mercy. And then before long, you're like, hallelujah. I mean, we started getting loud, people standing out the glass looking at us. Did you know he got healed? I mean, his fever broke. I mean, he went away. I mean, he, I mean, he was still sniffing a little bit. He looked at me, and he's glory to God. He said, I can work. Well, who's going to believe God to work? Well, if you get healed, you can work. Come on, y'all, you can't go into God's presence and stay the same. If you are, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> oh, to God, i got to listen to this myself, too. <laughs> verse, 20, uh, verse 2 in the, in the Passion Translation. Man, I'm getting caught up in it. Be in awe before His majesty. Be in awe before such power and might. Listen to this. Come worship wonderful Yahweh. Arrayed in all his splendor. Bowing in worship as he appears in all his holy beauty. Give him honor. Give him the honor due his name. Worship him wearing the holy garments of your holy priestly calling. How about that, y'all? I love that portion of scripture because it says, When you worship, things change. Not only does the atmosphere change, listen to this, y'all, so do you. You get into position. You get into that holy calling. You get into that place to where when you worship, man, everything has to change. How many of you are expecting something different in your life than what you have right now? 
Well, when you worship, you need to have one eye open looking for change. You need to have one eye open looking for it because that's what faith is. How can you worship God who is majestic and splendor and everything and full of glory and not have change take place in your situation or in your life? I mean, think about this. How can you worship God and not see the evidence of what's taking place with your worship? How can you worship God and stay the same? How can you worship God and stay mad? How can we worship God and stay angry and and, in unforgiveness? I mean, think about it. If we are truly doing this in spirit, it's going to shift everything about our lives, and I'm ready for a worship experience like never before. Do you understand? I'm ready to connect so different. I'm ready for the power and the glory of God to fall when we get in that place. Look here, if you learn how to worship properly, everything in your kingdom can be crumbling. But you attach yourself to a kingdom that cannot fail and that cannot fall and that cannot be shaken. Do you understand? This is, this is what God's trying to tell us. And you can live your life and, and live it in such a way to where you suffer all of the things that happen, all of the things that go on, all of the things that take place. You know, I... I Pam took all my sermon material when she put this thing out on. But we got all the way to the mountains, guys, and, and we were unloading, checking in to the, to the place where we were staying. And uh, I heard her go, oh, man. She said, I can't believe I forgot all of our shirts. We had one shirt apiece, and we were wearing it. So I got to thinking, well, you know, you flip them inside out. Wear them two days. I mean, you know, you think all kind. I do underwear better than I can shirts that way. But, um, you know, but anyway, I told her, I said, well, babe, we're about to do something that we've never done before. We're breaking the routine. Everybody say routine. And so we went shopping. And we bought shirts. Now, let me tell you something, guys. Here's the thing. There was a time in our lives where we'd have struggled to do that financially. Do you understand? Thank God. Come on, y'all. Say it with me. Thank God that we grow. And then we get to a place, and you know, and, and I told her, I said, I, we, had, we had a good time with it. I even, well, I better not say that one. I better not do that, because, no, I'm not. We were honeymooning, you know. Anyway, attach yourself, TMI, attach yourself to a kingdom that cannot fail. When you worship, that's what you do. Did you know there are angels flying around the throne? And all they're doing is singing about the glory and the holiness of God. Holy, holy, holy. Think about this, guys. It's the Lord God. And God never says, you know, I'm tired of that song. Can y'all come up with something new? Can y'all sing something different? That's why you can't attach your worship to a particular song. Because the song will wear out. You attach your worship to God. And that way it never gets old. Boy, that went over like a lead balloon. Isaiah 6 and verse 1. Y'all hanging with me, right? So you can have things happen in your life, guys, and all these things that happen in your life can stagger you and can take you away from doing what's right according to the Word of God. Now, you, you have opportunity sometimes, and I, I mean, I think there's not a whole lot I can share now that I haven't shared, but you, know, you ever had God just really get on you about some way you're believing or something that you're, you know, I, I, I had somebody, this has been years and years ago, I, we bought our first house and I bought a bike because I was trying to, when I first got saved, I was in the military and, and we had to do a run, so I'd run five miles just to keep it to where I could pass the PT test you know, physical training test. All right, but how many of you know it wasn't as much fun as it used to be? 
So I decided, you know, I'd got out of the military and I started putting on some weight. Yeah, look at me like that. Y'all know what it's like. And, uh, and so I got a bicycle, you know, and I started biking some and I was trying to get myself to where I could get in shape. Everybody say in shape because there is, there is an aspect where you need to be in physical condition too. Thank you, Lord. Amen. That ain't the fun part, but that's what we got to do. And somebody stole my bike. I parked it on my carport and somebody stole my bike. And I pulled up that day after work and I looked and my bike was gone. And I dialed the cops, you know, and got the sheriff to come out. And the sheriff said, um, look, we'll file, out the, we'll file the report. I hadn't had it too long, so we had everything. And he said, but I just want you to know, chances of you getting your bike back are like zero. And I got mad. I'd missed church to, to do this on Wednesday night. That was my first mistake. Come on, y'all. Everybody say first mistake. How many of you know I'm learning? Thank God for his grace. Amen. So then I prayed. And I said, because I prayed in anger. This is why I'm trying to tell you, you can't attach your worship just to an emotion. And we'll see this, or to a person, or to a group, or just to church, praise and worship. Do you follow me? I prayed, and I said, God, let the wages of sin overtake them now, not realizing what I said. What's the wages of sin, y'all? Death. So I'm going to pray for somebody to die over stealing a bike? How many of you know I got corrected immediately? Now, this is why worship is so important because you're in constant fellowship and communion with God. So what it does is it opens up so you can give and talk, but it also opens up so you can hear and receive. Come on, y'all, say it with me. I can hear and receive. No reason why any Christian should not be hearing God speak. Come on, y'all. No reason for it. Well, I've never heard God talk to me. Well, how about talk to him some? Because he talks to me enough for me and you both sometimes. And you know what he said to me? He said, do you realize what you just prayed? And I thought about it, and I had to take it back. I said, Lord, you know what? I should not have done that. I should not have done that. I should not have done that. And what it ended up doing was, you know, I told him, I said, well, I'd really like that because, you know, money was hard. You know, when you first get married, money kind of tough to come by sometimes. Well, after you've been married a while, it's tough to come by sometimes. And, um, you know, and, and he told me, he said, I mean, this is the way it was. I said, well, Lord, you know, I'd like to have the bike back. He said, but because of your attitude, you're going to have to sew it. So I prayed again. Now, listen to this, y'all. And I said, God, let it bless whoever got it. And I let it go. Now, I got another bike. Come on, y'all. I got another bike. But how you handle situations shows how you know how to worship. Okay, I'll get off of that one now. In the year King Uzziah died, this is what he says. This, he said, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. How many of you know a worship experience, worshiping God, should never just be something where we say, well, that was nice. It should always be an awesome time. Because we're, do you realize we have the right to worship the master of the universe? Come on, y'all. The king of all kings. Oh, <laughs> the Lord of all lords and we gonna clap and think it's good did I tell you I'm ready for some different worship in my own life and I'm not talking about it in church as much as I am at home I'm ready to connect a different way I'm ready to see things a little bit different I'm ready to be so invested into God that when I leave my house Everything shakes. And we can be there. Peter was so invested into God that when he walked down the street, think about this, guys. People laying in the street, his shadow touched them. And they were healed and set free. Don't tell me we can't have something different than what we have. 
Okay, the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each, having, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to, to another and said, Holy, holy, holy. Say that with me. Would you do that, y'all? Holy, holy, holy. Can we do it like we mean it? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Listen to this. The whole earth is filled and full of his glory. Now, when, we, when, when, when worship starts, you need to understand, guys, when true worship, when you get connected right, let me say it like, I'm having trouble getting the right words out, but when you get connected the right way, you're going to shake some of the foundational things in your life. And you're going to shake them to, to, to really get them to the point because there's some things, you know, I, my, my daddy and mom, they loved, and I shared a little bit with that. My dad wanted to, wanted to be the singing smiths. You know, so we were a southern gospel group. And we go around, and, you know, one of his favorite songs was um, I'll Fly Away and O Come Angel Band, you know, and, and we'd, sing, we'd sing all these songs. And, and you know, and, and man, we, we could go in. We were, my mom and dad were Baptists, but we could go into a Pentecostal Holiness Church and break out a revival because we knew how to sing songs. And my dad knew how to put on a show, just not being recorded, and that's good. My daddy could act like the most spiritual thing there was. And we could lead people there. We could get them there. Well, I mean, we did, it. we did a concert one time. My mom and dad, I remember, they did a bluegrass, bluegrass concert and sung Christian music at the bluegrass concert. I get it out. And, um, and drunk people came out and started dancing because they were just that good. I mean, they, they just had the, they had the right rhythm. They had the right harmony. They had everything good. But guys, just because you got all the stuff in place doesn't mean that you're connecting. See, anybody can put on a show. And I'm not looking for a show. You know, Pam, Pam and I were talking not too long ago, and she said, you know, because I was talking about going somewhere just to, you know, to get, uh, this sounds bad, but get something a little different, you know, and just get built up in a different way. And she said, well, how about going to a worship to a worship seminar. How about going, you know, to something like that? And I, so we started researching them, you know, but when I listen to them and I look at different ones, I, I just don't feel in my spirit they're right. Does everybody, you know, I, I don't want to go for a show. I want to go for a connection. I want an atmosphere to where the, mar the marvelous God is going to be touched. Does that make sense, y'all? I mean, I'm really trying to get this out, but I know it's not coming out like I want it. It says in verse 4, And the post of the doors were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Everybody say smoke. When, a true, when you truly start worshiping, it's going to expose some things in your life. You know, one of the things it does for me, and I, and I, I have to... I mean, worship realigns me. Does everybody, how many of you go to a chiropractor? Ever been to, been to a chiropractor at all? And, uh, you know, I think they do great, great things. I really do. And, um, but they'll tell you, you're out of alignment. Everybody say alignment. And part of what they do is they start realigning you. Well, I had, I had went to one. I, I, I had a numbness down this left leg, and it would hurt me so bad when I drive. I'd have to stop about every hour and get out. And I prayed, man, and I prayed, you know, and, and, uh, and finally my wife, she said, she said, I heard of a chiropractor, you know, about 16 miles away. This is when we were in West Virginia. She said, go, and um, they're not like the rest of them. They just won't keep you coming back. She supposed to. So I walked in, and she asked me, she said, what's going on? I told her exactly what was happening, and she had a table that you walked into. You just walk in, and you grab the handles, and then she hits the motor, and it lays you down. Now, how many of you know you're in trouble? When they're motorized, putting you on the back. And she, she put her hand on my back, and she said, she said, now I'm going to touch a spot. And she pushed a spot. And when she pushed it, it, that thing went off in my leg. I'm talking about. And she said, that's it right there, right? And I said, yeah. She said, well, just relax. And she popped, she popped it one time. And 80% of my pain and numbness left. Just like that. I went back to her five times. And I, I, can, I can keep it under check now. But let me tell you guys, in the spirit, we get the same way. 
we get these routines and we in our body, our spirit man gets out of alignment the right way. Can I say it like this? And part of what worship does is it brings us back into alignment because we can't focus on ourselves. Are you ready? We can't focus on how good we sing. We can't focus on whether we're on key, off key, whatever, because our focus has to be about him. And it brings that realignment. Everybody say realignment. Let me go a little bit further. In verse 5, this is where the realignment takes place. So, so I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Listen to what he says. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Everybody say that with me. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken from off the altar with, with tongs. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Everybody say realignment. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. So we see right here, guys, once we get a true connection, and I'm trying to do this without being too boring. Okay, once we get a true connection, what ends up happening is it's a repositioning, a realignment that takes place in our life, and then we can get rid of some of the junk that's been defeating us. How many of you got some junk that really defeats you? Anybody? Come on, y'all, be honest with me. How many of you got some junk that's been defeating you. Well, worship can kick that junk out. Worship takes the trash out. But it don't only just put it outside so you can go pick it up. Worship actually burns it. Gets rid of it once and for all. So you can get there. Now, now in, in, um, I have a message um, study Bible. And these are some of the notes. Will you bear with me for just a minute? I want to read you some of the notes. In the initial encounter between God and humanity, um, it does something about healing the differences how many of you know god's different than us <laughs> does anybody realize that how many of you think god's the same as you stop watching bruce almighty because that's not how god is okay i, I just want you to know <laughs> that's not how it is god there's a there's a distance between us and satan loves to keep that distance in place and what god does worship does is it moves you into an area where that distance is broken down and now you can understand and see God a little more clearly. God's revealed himself more to me personally through worship than he has any other way. Because I see him totally different. You know, when I start worshiping, I start thinking about how, how God loves me. Do you understand? It's not about how I love God. Worship is about how God loves me. So it breaks down the barriers so I can understand how much God loves me because if I can understand how much God loves me, I'm not going to have any issues with loving God. Does everybody follow me? I mean, it changes everything. It breaks that down. So there's some differences here that we have to get beyond, and, and this is what it does. There's the majestic apprehension of God's holiness manifested in his glory. There's a, humbling will, a humble willingness to admit failure. Everybody say failure. How many of you know, if you do something and you mess up, thank God for grace. We can fail and keep going, guys. We see it all the time. Think about David. I mean, think about some of the, the men of God in the Old Testament. They failed, and here we are. We fail and quit. You know, the difference between them is they knew God a different way than what we know God because we've allowed the enemy to tell us how much of a failure we are, and because we're a failure, God doesn't want to have anything to do with us when God knew we were failures already. And we just, we just buy into it. Man, if you're going to fall, fall in his arms. If you can't fall in his arms, crawl to him. You know, but keep moving in the right direction. This is part of that alignment. This is part of what worship does. It changes us. Um, it also, listen, listen and there's, a, there's God's grace that comes rushing in to do something about it. Isn't that good to know? and offering forgiveness and newness of life. Everybody say this with me. I am a new creation in Christ. I have a new life. Time for me to act like it. How many of you know, we just got to start acting like it. Quit acting like that old man and woman you used to be. 
That lifestyle is not going to fit you anymore because you're anointed out of it. Come on, y'all, you're anointed out of it. God's already taken care of that. He knew it don't fit you anymore. You got to become less to go back to that than you are right now if you, when you fail. God's grace covers you. Let me go through some stages here. Man, oh man. The first stage of worship is that complex intersection of divinity and humanity. Everybody say divinity and humanity. How many of you know God's the only one who can fix that mess? Have you figured that out yet? I mean, we are so human. <laughs> well, that's what we are. We think like that. We act like that. We talk like that. You know, it's amazing to me. You know, I had an aunt. She, she married a, a guy from Boston. And she lived in Boston so long, she started talking like them. And it was amazing. She could come back down, and I'd look at her. Aunt Peggy, what happened to your voice? Because you become what you hang around. You'll pick up the lingo of wherever you live. That's our humanity. That's who we are. And see, and God's trying to get us to understand that just because you're a human being, you can access spiritual things. Everybody here we right it's all spiritual. Think about this, guys. You can access so you have a heavenly language that changes everything about your earthly presence. <clears throat> That's why he says, excuse me, you're in the world, but you're not of it. Come on, y'all. You can live in the world and be all a part of the world, but you operate according to a different standard. So the first stage of worship is that intersection between the divinity of God and the humanity of man. Focusing on God's holiness <clears throat> and our unworthiness. Now, when it said that, it gets under my skin. But in our, in our human state, how many of you know we are unworthy? But in our spiritual state, we are just as worthy, clean as can be. This is why it has to be spiritual. It just can't be about coming and dancing everywhere. And by the way, y'all, you know, I lived in an area where, um, you know, we had some churches around us, more in North Carolina than it was us, they wanted, they, they, you went to church there, you had to kiss a snake. Now, let me tell y'all something. I kiss him with a shotgun. If I got to prove my worth by kissing a snake, I'm serving the wrong God. See, Jesus defeated that snake. It's not up to me to prove anything. It's just up to me to access. Amen, oh me. I ain't bringing out no snakes anyway. Thank you, Jesus. The second stage of worship is God speaking and our answering. Everybody say that with me. God speaks and I answer. So in other words, that means we let him talk a lot. You know, I know a lot of people when they pray, all they do is talk and complain to God about everything not going right in their life. Learn how to listen. Don't you think God already knows what's going wrong? Why well, you need to tell him again? Listen and figure it. Let him tell you how to get out of it. Everybody say, I'm listening. Third stage of worship is that we're sent out and our hearts are made right. Our minds informed with God's plans for the world. And our wills charged. Everybody say charged. With resolve of being a part of implementing those plans. So we have to get to a point. Let me finish with this one. Go to um, Mark 14, verses 3 through 9, and then we'll go, a diff we'll go a little bit further into this next week. But there has to come a point where you can lose yourself. Um, I mean, you can get so lost in him to where everything just is about God. Have you ever, you ever met somebody who's so spiritual you can't stand them? Have you ever met anybody like that? Come, be honest, y'all. You ever met anybody so spiritual you just can't stand them? You know, it used to be a phrase out years ago. I think it's still out now, but you can be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. And I know people like that. You know, what was, was I, I was at a meeting one time where this guy, we'd had, a, we'd had an altar service and people were praying around the altar. And we'd finished up, you know, and it was time. Part of my job at that point in time was to get people out of the church so we could close the church up. Well, how many of you know he was still worshiping? I went up and I grabbed him by the elbow just gently and touched him by the elbow and said, I said, hey, um, you know, we're closing the church down. you got to go. And he said, don't touch me. And I looked at him. I said, what in the world? He said, I'm spiritual. 
But how many of you know, nowadays I'd handle that different. <laughs> nowadays I'd have touched him different. Because you can be spiritual and still be touched. But you can be kooky anytime. <laughs> now come on, y'all. If God is so sensitive that somebody touching your elbow is going to disrupt what he's doing in you, something's wrong with your connection. You still on dial up. You ain't on high speed. Y'all know what I'm talking about. How many of you remember? You know, that's the way we used to have to go on the internet. Let me read this to you. Guys, we can get so, I, I don't know why I'm here, but anyway. We can get so touchy about the things of God that we never access what God has for us. If your atmosphere has to be perfect, you know, I, I was preaching one time, man, and we, we were having, at that time, we had revival breaking out in the church in West Virginia, and we were in a house that was seat. Um, they had built a room off of it. We only had parking for about, I don't know, 30 people, and we were, we were running 70 or 80 people, and, I mean, cars were bumper to bumper. People were backing into people because they wanted to leave, you know, and, and we just, I mean, we had an awesome thing going on, and I was preaching one day, and um, this little baby, uh, a little kid, come walking up the side, come over right where I was preaching and grabbed a hold of my leg and held on to me while I was preaching. <laughs> just just held on to my leg, you know. And I mean, I didn't get off be disrupting the anointing. What's wrong with you? But you know, I didn't look, hey, come get your kid. What's wrong with you? You know what I did? I picked that kid up. I just kept right on preaching. Kid didn't do a thing, you know, just looked at me while I was preaching. Preached a little bit and went back over, handed him to his mom. His mom kept him right there. Now, could I have let that, could I have let that affect me? Definitely. Can I tell you this? Some people in the church did. Because I heard them afterwards saying, I can't believe that woman let that kid do that. Well, y'all, you think Jesus preaching was organized? So nobody came up around him, and he stopped meetings because y'all are just not serious. You let this little kid. Guys, we get so touchy, we miss it sometimes. What about letting God be God regardless? What about learning how to worship even though things aren't perfect? Well, glory to God. Anybody in here need this, or am I just doing this for me? Mark 14, 3 through 9. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil and spikenard. I guess I said that right. And she broke the flask and poured it on his feet. But there were some, everybody say there were some, who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? Listen, guys. This is amazing to me how we as Christians, how many of you in here are Christians? We as Christians can get so touchy about things that we will miss opportunities. You know, one of the one of the weirdest things that, I, I mean, that happens in my life and one of the hardest things for me to do, and God has had to teach me through this, and, and I only share it because, I mean, it's, it's a struggle for me. I hate going to visit people and pick up money. And, but a lot of times, like, and, and I don't mind sharing this, you know, I'll, I, I'll go and, you know, visit people and they weren't able to come to church, so they'll give me a tithe check for the church. And I hate that. I mean, I, I, I just, I feel like they, I, I don't want them to think that's why I'm there. Do you follow me? I, I mean, I just don't want it, I don't want it to be about money. Come on, y'all, even though, you know, I understand. And God really had to correct me on this thing because he said, he told me, you know, just a while back, he said, you know, when you go and you visit people, Rick, you're doing what I've called you to do, to visit those who are sick. Come on, y'all. So you're a conduit for them because they can't come to church. So why would you not do it? But I still struggle with it because it makes me very uncomfortable. And we had a lady 
in the church, she, she got bedridden, and I had bedridden. I had to go and um, visit her in the hospital, and they had they had tied her down because she was she was acting up. And I remember I went in and I I got the doctor in and I asked the doctor. I said, "Would you please untie her?" And they said, "We can't do it, um, you know, because she's tried to scratch people." Well, she she was she she went. She passed out and woke up in a strange place. And I told the guy, I said, look, I'll, I'll take care of her if you untie her again to you, she won't do it again. And they untied her and they let her go. And she just relaxed. Listen, guys, we're, we're meant to be different. Okay? But it's amazing to me how sometimes that we see the cost and we worry about what it's going to cost us rather than just being pure in what we're doing. Can I read the rest of this? And then I'll comment a little bit on it in a Verse 5, it says, For it, it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii. Think about this, and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. Everybody say, but Jesus. Listen, but Jesus said, let her alone. Oh, my Lord. Don't you think it's about to get hot in the house? Let her alone. Listen to this. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do, do to them good. But me you do not have always. She has done what she could. Everybody say that with me. She's done what she could. She has come beforehand and anointed my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial for her. That's how important your worship is. Not only does it affect atmospheres, it affects your testimony forever. True worshipers, are you ready for this? True worshipers are going to connect in a way that other people will not connect. True worshipers are going to access things that other people cannot access. And true worshipers will get through every situation in their life because they know how to attach to the answer instead of just talking about the problem. Everybody say it with me. Are you ready? I am a worshiper. Did you get anything tonight? Man, I hope so. That's one of the hardest ones I've